Good morning and welcome one and all to the 25th anniversary of the Federalist Society and to this particular panel, which is a beacon of freedom. Uh, does America have a, a special mission? And um, I thought what we might do is um, divide this panel into um, three general segments. Um, the um, First, I'm going to ask uh, our various panelists to uh, give us uh, seven or eight minutes of opening remarks. And then upon the conclusion of that first segment, we'll have uh, a second segment in which uh, the, each of the panelists will um, talk among themselves uh, and interact and exchange um, views and then the third segment I um, hope will be um, we'd like to entertain questions to the various panelists um, from uh, members of the audience so I think we have a very exciting group here our friend Michael Barone got hung in traffic I'm sure but we'll be here shortly um, first panelists I would like to introduced to you is Professor Gordon Wood. And he is the uh, Alvo, uh, Allen Way University professor at Brown University. And he's written many, many books on the uh, founding period. His most recent is Revolutionary Characters, What Made the Founders Different, came out in 2006. Uh, I think one of the most encouraging things one of the most encouraging developments in the last several years is, well, the last decade really, has been this remarkable resurgence um, in interest about our founding generation. People bemoan the, the lack of historical literacy among um, many Americans, but alongside that, you have to take the welcome trends of how well many of the books about our founding generation are selling and the hunger that people have really for uh, learning about the people and the ideas of this period. And it's produced a remarkable generation of historians. And I think uh, among the very, uh, that everybody's short list of eminent historians in this resurgence uh, would include Professor Wood I've read a number of his books, and one of my favorites is his um, biography of uh, Benjamin Franklin. I've never completely understood Benjamin Franklin. He was one of the most difficult of the founding fathers for me to get a handle on. And I, I didn't completely understand how somebody with such strong ties to Britain and France as Benjamin Franklin had ended up being such a devout patriot and American. And uh, Gordon Wood uh, took me on that journey, and he's absolutely the best one uh, to uh, have along as a guide and companion to Benjamin Franklin's evolution. So I thought it would be good for him to start off, since he will give us some historical perspective on America's special mission and uh, Gordon, without further ado, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, th thank you very much, Judge. Is this alive? No? Is it? Okay. Well, I think uh, all of you know that the idea of American exceptionalism is not very popular in the academy uh, these days. Uh, I may be a little slow, but um, it, it, it was only about 12 years ago that it came, came to me how, how bitter and how deeply uh, many of the uh, professors in, in uh, universities today disliked the whole idea of American exceptionalism. A colleague and I were preparing a volume on, on the way Americans interpret, have interpreted their past, and we had a meeting of the participants, and uh, one of the uh, uh, members of that crew that was, we were going to edit this book she said to, to us, I, she comes from a very distinguished university, distinguished professor. 
She says, I will not be part of any volume which treats American exceptionalism in a positive manner. So uh, it's, um, it's clear that it is not popular at all, and that's still the true today. Now, whether America is an exceptional nation today, I think, is an issue I'll leave to maybe the discussion. Um, but we certainly saw ourselves in the past to be an exceptional nation. By exceptional, I, of course, I don't mean unique. Uh, every nation is, is unique. But, uh, but being exceptional means being different from all other nations and having special responsibilities to carry out some kind of mission that will benefit all humanity. Uh, and whether we have that or not today, I don't, I, I, I leave, as I say, I'll leave that for discussion, but we certainly did feel that way uh, through much of our history. It began with the American Revolution. Now, I forget, forget John Winthrop. He didn't know about the United States in 1630, but the Revolution really touched off our sense of ourselves as having a special role to play in the world. Um, by the first half of, during the first half of the 18th century, when Americans looked at themselves, the colonists looked at themselves, they felt a sense of deficiency, underdeveloped na uh, people. They were uh, not up to Europe. We, we lacked all of the things that made Europe uh, great. Uh, we had no magnificent cities, no court life, no uh, great aristocratic families, no large country houses, no palaces, uh, no established church. All the norms of Europe were lacking here in America. And, and the colonists had an acute sense of, of being deficient, of being underdeveloped, and that someday we would catch up to Europe. Well, the revolution changed all that. Uh, it, it was such a psychologically uh, exhilarating event because it transformed what had been deficiencies all overnight into assets for Republican government. Republican government, of course, did not need, our, in, in fact, did not want aristocracies, did not want great palaces, wanted uh, f simple farmers. Nine, uh, 19 out of 20 Americans lived in rural areas and, simple, and were simple farmers. This was suddenly the kind of society that best sustained a Republican government. And by Republican, we can translate to, to Democratic government because that's what they meant. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't long before republicanism was used as a synonym for, or, or democracy was used as a synonym for uh, republicanism. So suddenly, all of our sense of cultural and, and, uh, and social inferiority was transformed into um, social and cultural superiority. We were no longer in the backwaters of history, but we were suddenly cast to the, to the, into the vanguard of history. We were going to lead the world toward a new democratic republican future. And of course we assumed that the rest of Europe would follow us. And of course a decade later the French did exactly that. And we were enthusiastic at the outset over the French Revolution until it became abortive and, and, and failed. But we thought that the French, and the French have never forgiven us for this, that, that we stimulated their revolution. You remember, uh, Lafayette sends George Washington the, the key to the Bastille with a covering note saying, this is, you, you did it. You, you stimulated us into revolution. So it's uh, suddenly we, we had this sense that we were in the vanguard of history leading the world towards, towards uh, democracy. Uh, and and we, we, were, we were the leaders, in a sense, of the free world as early as 1776. And uh, in every revolution that followed, with one exception, but all of the revolutions that took place in 19th century Europe, starting with the French Revolution, which we said sadly failed, they weren't up to our, uh, our uh, they didn't have the stuff that our revolution was made of, and then the Latin American revolutions, breaking away from, from, from Spain and Portugal, the uh, Greek Revolution of 1820, the revolution of the bourgeois revolution of Louis Philippe, uh, the so-called Republican monarchy uh, of Louis Philippe in 1830, all of the insurrections in 1848, the French establishment of the Third French Republic in 1870. We were the first state in the world to extend diplomatic recognition to these new regimes, which most of them failed. Uh, but we were there first saying, we welcome you into the world of democratic 
revolutions. But we know, even as late as the Civil War, as Lincoln put it, we're the last best hope. All of these re Republican revolutions, these Democratic revolutions failed. We were alone in the world sustaining the dream, the future dream of free government and liberty for the rest of the world. Uh, we never sent troops, of course, but individuals went over and fought. And of course, uh, men like Louis Kossuth, uh, the Hungarian patriot, came to the United States to raise money in 1850 for the Hungarian Revolution. And in our diplomatic messages, there's some wonderful messages uh, full of bombast uh, from Secretary of State Daniel Webster and, and uh, others uh, taking credit for all of these revolutions that took place. We didn't deny it. When the uh, Austrian-Hungarian minister in Washington protested our support for the revolutions in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire in 1848, Webster didn't deny it. No diplomatic uh, language here. He says, yes, we take full responsibility for all those revolutions. That was the sense of our, of our destiny. That was the point we were. Uh, we 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 felt we were we belonged, leading the world. The, all these revolutions were species, so to speak, of the revolutionary genus Americanus. All of a sudden, 1917, everything changed. Now you know, 1917 in Russia is broken into two parts. When the Kerensky government took over, the Tsar uh, abdicates. We were, seven days after the Tsar abdicated, we recognized the new Kerensky government, the new revolutionary government. We were the first state in the world to do so. We were enthusiastic. Wilson said he now had a fit partner for his League of Nations, for his getting together a whole community of democracies. Russia was now a democracy. We were enthusiastic. We were in the vanguard again, leading the world towards democracy and free government and liberty. But then, in the fall of 1917, all that changed. The Bolsheviks took over, and the re re response was very, very different. Uh, instead of being the first government to recognize the new Soviet Union, we were the last major Western, Western power. Sixteen years and four presidents, we withheld diplomatic recognition from the, from the Bolshevik uh, Soviet Union a traumatic turnabout, to say the least. Why should this have happened? Uh, what was different? What caused this abrupt change in, 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 uh, in, in attitude? I think it was the nature of the Bolshevik uh, appeal, the new character of this communist ideology. The Bolsheviks claimed not simply to be leading another anti-monarchical Republican revolution in emulation of the American or the French models of the 18th century, the Russian Revolution was not another species, so to speak, of the revolutionary genus Americanus, but a new genus altogether. The Bolsheviks said that their communist revolution represented a totally new departure in world history. The great antagonism that grew up between the United States and, and the Soviet Union rested not simply on the uh, exigencies of power politics or on uh, the circumstances of, of a different marketing systems, but more important, I think, on the competitiveness of two very different revolutionary traditions. The Cold War really began in 1917. We actually sent troops uh, trying to put down the Soviet uh, rebellion, uh, revolution. Because the, the threat was serious, because the Soviet Union threatened nothing less than the displacement of the United States from the vanguard of history. The Russians, not the Americans, now claim to be pointing the way toward the future, and more alarming, still there were Americans in the 1920s and 30s that agreed with that claim. For the first time since 1776, Americans were faced with an alternative revolutionary ideology with universalist aspirations equal to their own. This ideological threat, I think, was far more serious to us than the technological threats of the uh, Russians getting the H-bomb or, or uh, launching Sputnik. Uh, because this, this, for it seemed to make uh, uh, all of American history, uh, all of our heritage irrelevant. If we Americans were not leading the world toward liberty and free government, what then was our history all about? Well, rather than attempting an answer to that question, uh, I'll leave that uh, for uh, the other panelists. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Gordon, thank you so very much. And now, our next uh, speaker will be Michael Barone. He is a senior writer for the United States U.S. News and World Report and a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And one of the great things I think about Michael is that he's a powerful macro thinker and he's also an expert micro thinker on the uh, whole path of American politics. Uh, he's written the encyclopedic work on American politics, the almanac of American politics. And those of you who've thumbed through the, the almanac, I don't suppose anybody's read it start to finish. Um, you understand that this is a, a work of uh, iconic stature, which has become a standard and authoritative reference uh, on the voting records and the lay of the land in each of our various congressional districts. And you would think that doing the almanac would be a full-time job for Michael, but he's a much sought-after commentator, both uh, in print and in, on television. And uh, he's written a, good, a great number of books, uh, which have been a reflection on the American character and on the nation's uh, future path. And his most recent is Our First Revolution, The Remarkable British Upheaval That Inspired America's Founding Fathers. Michael, it's such a pleasure to have you here, and I'd, we enjoy hearing your remarks. Thank you, thank you, Judge Wilkinson. It's uh, it's an honor. Okay, thank you, Judge Wilkinson. It's an honor uh, to be here in this panel. Uh, my own career has gone uh, from law to political consulting to journalism, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yes, well, I, Richard Epstein was a classmate, and I did manage to get some words in edgewise, but the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at the, more than my fair share, he says. Uh, <laughs> quite agree. Uh, yeah, the, each one of those professions pays less than the one before. Uh, and as I reflect from my transition from the world of political consulting, where people are honorable, trustworthy, truth-telling, uh, and go into journalism, each of them has sort of descended on a moral plane as well. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the We've, it, the subject here is American exceptionalism, and I is fascinated by uh, Professor Wood's uh, presentation. Uh, you know, once upon a time, just about everybody in American politics uh, during most of the 20th century was an American exceptionalist. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Harry Truman and John F. Kennedy, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, if you'd suggested to any of them that America was not a special or exceptional nation, uh, they would have been astonished. And uh, they, uh, uh, they believe that very fervently, they practice it very fervently, and virtually all voters, I think, tended to take that view. I mean, if you want to, one uh, phrase that tells you uh, the story on American exceptionalism, uh, listen to Franklin Roosevelt's uh, Pearl Harbor speech, his speech to Congress the uh, Monday after Pearl Harbor, uh, where he, uh, the, the biggest applause line uh, comes in response to the sentence, uh, um, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. And he's got that, the internal rhyme of righteous might uh, says both we are strong and we are good. And uh, there's an implication that we are in some way unique with uh, unique in this way that we have a mission to bring freedom and democracy to the world uh, there's an understanding that that mission cannot be entirely successful at any given time uh, that we have to make compromises and accommodations along the way uh, Roosevelt didn't say so in that speech but it would have been hard to win World War II without the alliance with the Soviet Union uh, but uh, the thought was there uh, until really, I think, the late 1960s, um, about the time Richard Epstein and I were at Yale Law School, um, the, uh, uh, the vast majority, American exceptionalism was uh, unexceptionable in American politics. 
Uh, but since the late 60s and since that period when uh, many of us as university students uh, declined to serve our country and rationalized our decision by saying, hey, it isn't a very good country anyway, uh, things have been different. Uh, and we've had uh, a, a, two strains in American politics, American exceptionalism and what Professor Samuel Huntington has called uh, transnationalism. Or sometimes you hear, you hear the phrase, multi, in a different context, multiculturalism. Uh, and that credo seems to be that uh, no country is morally superior to any other. Uh, all countries, all societies, all cultures are morally equal, except ours, which is worse. Uh, the, uh, uh, and um, the, uh, to me, of course, this seems to be kind of a profoundly misreading uh, profound misreading of history. Um, you know, we're constantly assailed because the United States, Anglo-American society, had slavery. Well, of course, every society uh, has had slavery. Uh, one society uh, started the movement to end first the slave trade and then slavery itself. The Anglo-American society, uh, the, uh, we're, we're celebrating the 200th anniversary this year of the uh, British Parliament uh, abolishing the slave trade, uh, a task to which they spent uh, blood and money at the Royal Navy to enforce on the world. Uh, and they were followed up by Americans uh, as well. Uh, interestingly, mostly people motivated by religious belief, evangelical Christians and Quakers in particular. Uh, so uh, we lose sight, the multiculturalists, the transnationals lose sight of the fact that in fact uh, the movement against slavery is a movement in which the United States was at least among those in the vanguard uh, and that we were not the most repressive society. I mean, if you want to see societies that have had have real difficulty, look at societies where it had slavery imposed by the French, Louisiana, Haiti. Uh, <laughs> those are places that start <clears throat> with a real handicap. <clears throat> we see this uh, we see this conflict between transnationalism and American exceptionalism play out from time to time in our national politics. Uh, it's not an equal fight if you're counting voters. Uh, in 2004, uh, the pollster Scott Rasmussen asked voters two questions that related to American exceptionalism. Uh, the first was whether America is basically a fair and decent country or not. The second was whether the world would be better off if more countries were more like America or not. Uh, the responses to the two questions were similar. About two-thirds of the voters said yes and took the American exceptionalist position. About one-quarter said no, uh, the transnationalist uh, uh, position. If the polling had been done, of course, only in law school faculty lounges, the results would have been rather different. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Uh, about one quarter said no. Among Republican voters, something like 90% answered yes to both questions. Uh, among Democratic voters, the margins were uh, much closer in the nature of uh, 47 to 39% or something like that, a pretty equivocal margin, uh, which reminds me of the story of the Teamsters Union business agent who was in the hospital and he received a bouquet of flowers and a card which read, the executive board wishes you a speedy recovery by a vote of nine to six. <laughs> um, and uh, in general, the transnational position splits the democratic, the transnational American exceptionalism uh, divide splits the Democratic Party, uh, whereas American exceptionalism tends to unite the Democratic Party. On balance, this is an advantage for the Republican Party, but not always. I mean, as President and, and ex-President Bill Clinton is able to voice uh, American exceptionalism uh, as well as any president we've had, uh, intermittently interrupted by apologies for past American misdeeds. He can uh, do both of them. Uh, but it's a, uh, uh, you know, it, it has been, I think, uh, a balance uh, that favors the Republicans. Uh, when John Kerry, uh, or I called him at one point John Francois Kerry, uh, in, 19, in the 2004 presidential base said that we ought to be meeting an international test, that was immediately uh, a, a indication that uh, uh, 
to the Bush campaign that they had uh, yet another uh, line that they could use in advertisements to go with, I did actually vote for the $87 billion before I voted against it. Um, the, uh, you, we've seen this in past campaigns. Michael Dukakis in 1988 was attacked uh, on the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the town of Brookline, which he lives in and which he had represented in the Great and General Court of Massachusetts from 1968, uh, 62 to 74, uh, had uh, staged votes at the town meeting every year whether to say the Pledge of Allegiance before the meeting. They generally came out against it. Uh, we've seen in this campaign, interestingly, Barack Obama not putting his hand over his heart during the singing of the national anthem for whatever that's worth. Um, some of these things, I think, can be dismissed as trivial. Um, but uh, they're also part of a larger tradition. Uh, Professor Wood uh, brings us up to the period of 1917 uh, when uh, America fears being displaced as the uh, progressive revolutionary force for freedom and democracy in the world uh, and as the wave of the future. Um, I think since that time, uh, the United States uh, has stood for uh, freedom and democracy in the world and generally with the approval of the American people. And in my view, that's part of a longer uh, tradition. Uh, it's a tradition uh, to shamelessly plug one of my latest books, Our First Revolution, uh, which is about what it, the series of events usually called the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89. Um, William of Orange, a Dutchman, uh, came to England, became king, in large part to uh, enlist England and the British Isles in the struggle against the, what he considered to be the great tyrannical force of the uh, power of the time. Fran France is ruled by King Louis XIV and its expansionist tyrannical power. And that has been the motif of British foreign policy uh, for most of the years since and has been the motif of American foreign policy uh, in the years uh, in the 20th century with World War I, World War II, uh, the Cold War, uh, and now the uh, struggle against uh, Islamic fascists. And I think that's, uh, uh, it is a form now of American exceptionalism that we are the inevitable leaders and major uh, participants uh, in these struggles, uh, however many allies we've had. Uh, American exceptionalism can sometimes come into uh, bad odor with the voters when things seem not to be going well, uh, as they have not been going well in 2005 and 2006 in Iraq. Uh, but on balance, I think that it is, uh, it is still something that is believed in by the vast majority of the American people, though by no means the vast majority of our elites. Thank you. Our next panelist is Richard Epstein, who is the uh, James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1972. He has also been a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute since 2000. And if there is a more prolific uh, legal scholar in our country than Richard Epstein, um, I don't know who it would be. And if there's a more, more provocative or more probing questioner of conventional norms in our country than Richard Epstein, I don't know who it would be. And if someone deserves more of the title of Renaissance lawyer than Richard Epstein, <laughs> I'm not sure who it would be. I want you to just listen to this. Richard Epstein has taught courses in civil procedure, constitutional law, communications, I'm still on the seas, <laughs> conflicts of laws, civil procedure, uh, cr criminal law, jurisprudence, health law and policy, legal history, property, real estate development and finance, labor law, land use planning, patents, individual, estate and corporate taxation, Roman law, torts, and workers' compensation. And my question for you is, why the heck haven't you taught admiralty? 
<laughs> because I'm out to sea. <laughs> Those of you who know Richard will know that he's not afraid to tell you when he thinks you're wrong. It's happened many times to me over the years. And who knows, it could happen again this morning. Richard? Oh, thank you. I guess a good bit of good-natured ribbing is par for the course. I'm, I'm actually kind of troubled, a little bit tongue-tied today on what it is to speak. I, I'm not really very good, I think, at sort of these very large, grand themes like American exceptionalism. So I was going to try to see if I could figure out how to make it slightly narrow in its scope. And as I was sitting here uh, last night working on these remarks, I, I thought of starting perhaps a little bit with immigration policy. Um, and, and the reason I did so is actually perfectly well captured in the pamphlet that was distributed, because one of the hallmarks of American exceptionalism that we've had is, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. And a hundred years ago, this country, when it was smaller and poorer than it is today, admitted several million new immigrants, most of whom had no visible means of support, and were able to convert them into generations of productive citizens going forward. And indeed, I take this quite personally because my grandparents were all part of that great movement into this country, and my parents, of course, were those first generations, the beneficiaries of the situation. And now when one starts to look at something like immigration policy, one sees a very different picture. Uh, you have these very sharp restrictions, for example, on workers, such that if you're trying to get in skilled people into the United States today, the available slots are exhausted within 24 hours of the posting, and we are now faced with the aptitude that if we cannot bring workers to come to the United States, we may have to send our businesses overseas, or if we fail to send them overseas, have other people pick up the slack and leave us very much in the rear. And so the question that one wants to ask on this sort of mid-level question is exactly what is it about the attitudes that Americans had then and now which indicates the very sharp differences in ch changes rather in the way in which we approach this absolutely critical subject. And I think that Gordon Wood was on to something when he said that the United States early on always had this sense of its own superiority when it realized that the traditions of Europe, which it once envied, all of a sudden became to be perceived, and rightly so, as these huge change and shackles on the way in which they were able to perform. Uh, the great advantage of America was it did not have any hereditary monopoly. The great advantage of America is that we did not have guilds. The great advantage of America is when somebody new came into town, we did not think of him only as the competitor who would take away from us the business that we had, but we also saw in him somebody who would be the supplier, somebody who would be the customer. And we kind of internalized long before it was formulated uh, that essentially free entry into open markets on the domestic and on the international stage will in the long term lead to the improvement of the average advantage of all citizens, and if what you do is you start to create this fatal equation whereby competitive industry is to be treated like physical harm or fraud, what you are doing in effect is saying that the world's most dynamic and productive processes shall be equated with petty theft, robbery, and so forth. And when one hears, for example, and it's already been mentioned, the Kerry famous state that anybody who wishes to outsource is engaged in Benedict Arnold, this is the kind of change in attitude that you have to imagine and have to understand is that international trade, which the fewer the barriers, the better, is now treated as a form of high treason by those of us who do not understand what the long-term dynamic situation is. The United States, to the extent that it's going to be able to succeed in the world and so forth, must keep to the dynamic and open vision which starts with the Scottish Enlightenment and comes forward. Have we been faithful to that particular tradition? Well, I think the only answer that I can give to that is that the United States is such a large and complex country that it is impossible to find in it any uniform thread moving in one direction or another. Indeed, there are many kinds of serious reversals on these particular trends and many cases in which they've been, I think, glowingly affirmed. One of the ironies, of course, has to do with our self-perception of what it means to be progressive in the United States. And I guess if I had to think of a more retrograde and negative philosophy, uh, it would be that of progressivism in the United States as it existed between 1930 and 1932, which eventually started the New Deal programs, most of which, when you looked at root, were all efforts to try and restrict entry 
into various kinds of industries, uh, create elaborate cartels. Amity Schles's book dealing with the Schechter case makes it very clear just how powerful this, sent, this system is. If you take the great constitutional case of Wicked and Filburn, what you do is you see the courts turning somersaults with respect to the Commerce Clause to make the world safe for American agricultural cartels. Um, which are designed to disrupt arrangements overseas. If you look at the Smoot-Hawley tariff in 1930, a pure Republican convention, convection, it was essentially opposed by every economist at the time, and nonetheless the politicos decided that they were going to impose it and thereby managed to create some kind of a major world depression, which was then falsely attributed to market forces. So we have a lot of sort of ambivalence in our traditions. My question is, what about the positive side? And here I want to turn just very briefly to a thing that was stated by Boyd and Gray, because I think it shows us when we keep to our visions, we manage to do very well. Um, he referred to the fact that the United States, unlike Europe, is able to create a pretty powerful internal market with respect to the movements of goods and services. And I have no doubt that if you were to try to list the great achievements of American constitutionalism, one with a somewhat dubious textual base, somewhat dubious, but immensely powerful and positive contributions, is of course the Dormant Commerce Clause, the Negative Commerce Clause, or whatever you wish to cure it. And what's so interesting about it is if you figure out the way in which the American system worked, it was an absolutely systematic application of classical liberal principles to a problem which would have otherwise daunted lesser individuals. They managed to say that if you wish to impose a barrier on the outside guys, you have to impose it on the inside guys. This is an ideal compromise because it means on the one hand you can have forms of state regulations, but you can play the EU game, which is to make sure that they're going to have hostile and differential impacts with respect to other people. It turns out there are a few narrow exceptions for shipping poisonous goods and so forth across state lines, which are perfectly consistent with open market principles. And how does this thing get created? By the same court that gave us Wicked and Filbert. So what you have to do in America is to sort of understand the huge split that starts to take place. Now, going forward and so forth, the hard question that we have to face is which of these two kinds of ideologies will take forward and dominate the way in which this country works. And here I fear the following very serious kind of syndrome, which I think is bipartisan in its implications, which is there is no question at the grand level we are all, I think, American exceptionalists, not all of us, but most of us. And we tend to believe in limited government and whatever it is that makes American great by way of constitutionalism and popular democracy. The problem is when you go one level down, what you start to see are these incredible programs which should only be described as sort of disgraces to the human race. And so, you know, you watch, for example, the way in which the beet subsidies and the sugar subsidies and the import and the export quotas are organized and devised by the United States Congress. And what you come to understand and what makes it so troublesome to be an American citizen at this point is that there is an enormous slippage that takes place in our internal affairs between the sort of lofty statements that we make about ourselves, which are to some extent true, and then the rather sordid stuff that sometimes goes down on the ground by the very same sorts of people. There is a kind of a sort of acoustical or a moral separation in which you are able to talk one way as part of a general political celebration and then act another way when it comes to the question of how we do things on the ground. Now, what is the source of this? And I'll just end on this particular note. I cannot stress that what Learned Hand said about the spirit of liberty surely matters an enormous amount when you're trying to create large political institutions. The great trouble that I see in the United States with respect to these issues is that there has been the last president who truly internalized the Scottish Enlightenment and the classical liberal beliefs, who had it in his bones, was Ronald Reagan. And since that time, what has happened is we've had people who've been much more measured and much more politic and much more circumspect, so that the appropriate debate now becomes how much should we raise the minimum wage rather than the question of whether we ought to have it at all. And I think there is, in this sense, this kind of consensus doing business in a place like Washington, which is extremely troublesome. And I will end just on this particular note about, I think, how we keep an exceptional country going as long as we have. And that's the following maxim that I like to say. 
is it's the principles that make you great are the only principles that will keep you great. When this country started, and we did have this sense not so much of individualism but of individual opportunity, and the right sense that voluntary cooperation would dominate coercion and protectionism, what we did is we managed to rise to the point where we became the envy of everybody else who always thought they were much smarter than we were because they had some organized French-like way of making sure that the economy marched in lockstep progression. But once we've gotten successful, what, there's a temptation to say, you know, we don't really have to worry about that stuff. We can worry about the little man who loses. We can start having job training programs. We can have protection for little industries. We can make sure that the small farmer never gets dislocated. And we forget that progress always requires, in some sense, bankruptcy, and that we should never engage in the kinds of individual special pleading if, in fact, we know we have a large and thriving and expanding economy. And to the extent that we forget that when we're successful, it will simply turn things around. Uh, a nation is sort of like the Golden State Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, whatever it is. You start painting it at one end, and by the time you're done, you've got to go right back and keep on going. And to the extent that we ever rest on our laurels, that's the time when we will not be an exceptional nation, we'll be a dud nation. And that's something we have to work very hard to avoid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Richard. Now our next panelist will be Charles Freed, who has had a distinguished career, to say the least. He, from September 1995 to June of 1999, he was a member of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. When in July of 1999, he returned to Harvard as a full-time and chaired member of that faculty. And in October of 1985, uh, he became Solicitor General of the United States, where he represented the Reagan administration before the Supreme Court in no fewer than 25 cases. Um, Professor Freed is, is not just a very able lawyer. He really is one of America's wisest men. And everyone I know, uh, has at one time or another come to Charles Freed for advice. Uh, and this is from cabinet officers and the highest ranking government officials to many generations of Harvard uh, law students for whom he has served as a counselor and mentor. And I think the question I've often asked, why, why is it that so many good people come to Charles Freed for advice? And I think it's because he brings to his conversations enormous erudition and a great deal of life experience and seasoned judgments and perhaps most of all a, a kind and caring manner. And um, I would also say if there's a legal philosopher for our time, it is Charles Freed. He's written some very marvelous books, the latest of which is Modern Limit, Liberty and the Limits of Government, and in that book, which is I recommend to you strongly, he's taken a very ancient value and concept and brought it into contemporary times. Charles, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Jay. Is this live? If you are. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, because what I want to appear as much as a, a witness uh, or an advocate, I want to be uh, an exhibit. Uh, in 1987, when I was Solicitor General, one of the most moving occasions uh, in that office, was not arguing before the Supreme Court, but being asked by a federal district judge who was swearing in a large group of immigrants about the size of this audience to address the new Americans. And I was able to say to them that you and I are the lucky ones we are the real Americans 
because you and I have chosen to be American like you. I, when I was 13 years old, uh, raised my hand, swore allegiance to the United States, and became an American. Uh, so it means a great deal to me. And what is it? What is it that I swore allegiance to? Uh, an allegiance which has only grown deeper uh, and more intense. Of course, it is liberty. That is American exceptionalism. And happily, it's not so exceptional. Happily, it is a spirit which, in one form or another, is known throughout the world. But it is not known throughout the world as intensely or in as operative a way as it is in this country. One must recognize the history and the intellectual forebears. Uh, we've heard about them. They are Hume, they are Adam Smith, uh, and those who uh, in fact shamed us, like Wilberforce. We had our, no, no Wilberforce in America was as effective as Wilberforce was in Great Britain as early. Uh, so we have to be aware of that. Nonetheless, that liberty has always been our uh, commitment. Now, that liberty has had to fight real enemies, but the enemies within are the sophistries, the sophistries about which we've heard a little bit today. Uh, Michael spoke about them. Those are the real enemies of liberty. Those are the enemies which say, there's no such thing. Uh, rather, uh, liberty must arise from government. It does not give rise to government. And therefore, liberty is the creature of politics. Politics cannot be disciplined by liberty. And of course, therefore, politicians rule us. But liberty has a firm foundation, both in our hearts and intellectually. That foundation comes from the sanctity and the primacy of the individual. We are a country of liberty, but we are a country devoted to the concept, to the principle of individualism. That is the uh, key to our exceptionalism. Uh, in the book you mentioned, I make an argument that liberty is simply the normative manifestation of the concept of, individual, of individualism. And of course, individualism has a long history. Uh, it has a history in the Enlightenment, to be sure, but it, of course, has a history back in Christianity. Because if you think about it, what is individualism? Individualism is the notion that at the end of the day, and indeed throughout the day, we are all responsible for ourselves, and for uh, how our lives go, what we make of ourselves. That's the point. In an older language, that was the notion that each of us has a soul, and we each of us are responsible for the salvation of that soul. Nobody can do it for us. And if somebody does do it for us, it hasn't happened. Now, the enemies of liberty also come forward with another notion, uh, less, uh, uh, less sinister than the notion that liberty simply can't exist. 
that it's an incoherent idea. And that is the caricature of liberty, of individualism, as the equivalent of selfishness, egoism, indifference to value, total relativism, because if I'm an individual, I'm responsible for myself, then, hey, whatever I want is as good as whatever you want. And those, of course, are completely different ideas. And they are wrong ideas. The individual is responsible for himself, for his own soul, to discover truth, not to propagate lies. Most importantly, not to propagate lies to himself. And it is a great truth that the only thing as valuable as my own soul is every one of your souls. And therefore, that is not egoism. That is the truest form of community. So to think and to choose, those are the principles of liberty. And from that is entailed the liberty to work and the liberty to enjoy the fruits of one's labor. And from that, of course, comes the great principle of the market. The market is one of our glories. We didn't invent it. Adam Smith got the idea. Others have it. But we in this country, I think, understand that the market is not just a device, a kind of uh, thing that uh, some uh, government agency or some think tank might uh, devise. The market in s it's, is in fact the locus of free individuals cooperating freely with each other. And the fact that that's done with money and with credit does not undermine the notion of the market as the coming together of free individuals. It expands it because what it means is not only can I come together with Gordon Wood and give him my book and he gives me his, but I can come together with people I have never seen and who are not yet born or who died a long time ago, and that is what money does. It is a storehouse of the values that others have created, which I can now exchange with them. And that is an expansion of liberty, and in no way an excuse for its contraction. Well, uh, we are exceptional to the extent that we seem really to believe it. Not all of us. Uh, many of us in this room do. Uh, others in other rooms may not. But I think that is uh, an American creed. Thank you. I thought what we would next do is have the panelists gauge, engage in a little conversation among themselves and then take questions. Um, I'd like to pick up um, on a point that Michael Barone made and, and toss it for a minute to, um, to Gordon Wood. Um, Michael was making the point that throughout American history, so many presidents, beginning with Will Theodore Roosevelt Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt Truman, Kennedy, Eisenhower, Reagan, um, were devout believers in American exceptionalism. And uh, that lar they, large, overwhelming majorities of our, our countrymen were as well. And then the question comes, why has so much of elite opinion turned against American exceptionalism relatively 
um, recently. Um, I'm just not sure what the explanation for this is. Is it a product of the, are we still dealing with the legacy of the 1960s? Uh, is it the absence of the Soviet Union as a, as a foil during the Cold War, which made it sort of easier to rally um, behind an ideal of American exceptionalism? Is it, is it the fact that the Iraq War is, is, is dragging on for so long? Is that a drag in turn on our feelings of American exceptionalism? Uh, is it that any time our foreign policy embodies Wilsonian elements, does that create a backlash of sorts against American exceptionalism at home? Uh, but I, I think Michael is absolutely right in saying that there has been a turn among elite opinions in the entertainment industry and in the academy and in many other high quarters against the notion that America is an exceptional nation. And I want to call on Gordon's vast historical perspective and ask him, does he agree with Michael's point about the fact that there has been a turn? And Gordon, I'd like to hear your thoughts about why it's been so. Well, sure, it's been a great turn. Uh, but we don't want to think of it just simply as a product of the 1960s, uh, although I think that was a crucial point. But we've all been complicit in this turn. Uh, but I would start with the beginning of the 20th century. I think that, that's when, uh, when, when things really uh, began to be questioned. And, and I, I think of Frederick Jackson Turner and, uh, and the end of the frontier. That was a very important moment. And Americans began thinking, look, uh, since free land was the source of our bonanza, it's come to an end. Uh, things have got to change. And, and, and uh, the, the first New Deal of Roosevelt is very much influenced by that turn of thesis, if you will. If you read, Fred, uh, uh, read uh, Roosevelt's Commonwealth Club speech that he gave during the campaign, Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, uh, a very important speech that outlines the whole first New Deal, he says, look, the pie has stopped growing. We've got to divide it up. And that goes to the point you're talking about. We're no more expanding. It's going to be sliced up into pieces. And uh, that's really a sense that the, uh, the end is, is here, and all we can do is divide it up equitably. Uh, that certainly does not speak to an exceptional nation. And it, it touches on the point that was made about, about the First New Deal. But I think in the more recent times, we've been complicit in this. I mean, Ambassador Gray is in. Belgium, Brussels, pushing for the European Union. That's to break down the, we're, we're in favor of the European Union. We want these nations to do away with their national loyalties, if possible, to become Europeans. Well, that's in the air, and it's happening in America as well. People talk about transnational feelings. Now, it only touches the academy, thank God, but it doesn't reach most people, although, how many people carry two passports now? And the court has apparently, much to my amazement, has okayed this. People can serve in foreign armies. They can carry more than one national passport. And we wonder why people's national allegiance is eroding. I think we're complicit in this. We who are, dislike this kind of lack of national patriotic feeling, uh, we're nonetheless, many of us, I mean, uh, Israeli, that you can carry an Israeli passport and an American passport. The Irish have, if you have an Irish grandparent, you can get an Irish passport and keep your American passport. It makes it great traveling through the EU because you can move right, right from one country to another, go through that green line, unlike the rest of us. And then when you come to the United States, you get your American passport out and you come in faster as well. Now, what does all this mean? I think there's an erosion of national feeling. So far, it has not touched us very directly, uh, the, most of us. But uh, I think the Europeans are, are being encouraged to do away with it. So in that sense, we're complicit in this erosion of, of national identity. Um, 
Can I comment on that? Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I think that there's a slight confusion of two elements, and let me see if I could sort of separate them. The first one is, is one of the catastrophic implications of, of course, the Turner thesis and Roosevelt's understanding, is to think that somehow or the expansion of wealth is tied to very vacant land. I mean, you start to think of where the real increases in wealth have come through technology, intellectual property, more intensification, international trade. Um, the moment you really do believe that growth has stopped, what happens is you then engage in redistribution and you don't realize that you've killed the growth and made true. So I mean, the level of ignorance that represents in the American Christian is so vast that it's almost incomprehensible to think that that man could become president of the United States with that particular set of views. <laughs> Except that he's replacing somebody who, who made similar mistakes on all sorts of other issues. That's the first one. The second point on the internationalism. There's a good side to internationalism. I mean, one of the terrible problems that we've always had is the natural law, positive law tension, is that under positive law, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets, the sovereign has immunities, it has special preferences, citizens get advantages. The standard natural law theory, starting with Justinian and Gaius, is exactly the opposite. All people in the world are exactly the same. They all have, as Charles says, like liberties. The idea like means that we're not egotists, it means that we share this. And if you get the weakness of national loyalties to some extent, it might actually we create a more internationalist view with respect to international trade and tariffs and remove some of the protectionism. So and that's a much more complicated set of emotions. Well, what we can say, I think, with complete confidence is that the Roosevelt idea that stagnation is the necessary feature of modern industrial development is clearly wrong, and I think we really have to work out the implications of multiple citizenship in similar kinds of issues. Aren't you making something of a mistake, Richard, nope. when you... <laughs> 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 You're not judged now. <laughs> see, that, see, that, that's, that, that's a stopper. Um, but, but Richard, you tend to look at American exceptionalism as a function of markets and free trade and, and the rest, but that isn't really, I mean, that's not the essential element of American exceptionalism, is it? The, the essential element of American exceptionalism is as much a legal concept as it is a free market or whatever, and the elements of that, which is a, a nation with no official religion, a nation of dual sovereignties, which was a dramatic break from the ideas of Montesquieu in the late 18th century, a nation with an independent judiciary, a nation with representative government resting upon the consent of the governed, a nation with basic rights in here in the individual which a state may not infringe, a nation with a written constitution which government must observe, a nation where government is subservient to law and where law rules irrespective of men, the wishes of men and women, and whether free markets thrive or whether they don't thrive, those legal elements which comprise American exceptionalism have not been compromised. And that is uh, one of the reasons I am so befuddled by this turning of elite opinion against American exceptionalism because it seems that those bedrocks of our legal order remain in place. Harvey, Charles, you Jay, Jay I think you're, you're the one that's mistaken. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, it, and this is the mistake. It's not a, it's not a deep mistake, and it's easily corrected. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the mistake, and I thought I'd point it in that direction, is to somehow see markets as a kind of second rate and uh, slightly grubby thing compared to the great things of the rule of law and independent judiciary and so on. That's not true. Markets are, as I was urging, the manifestation of free spirit and they cannot exist without all of those things you've talked about. They cannot exist. You can't have markets without stable rules of property. And you cannot have stable rules of property without uh, a rule of law and an independent judiciary and all of those things. So those are all, uh, they're all related. They're not, 
uh, they are not first and second rate versions of each other. They are the thing itself. Can I just chime in here? I, I, Richard wants to relitigate the election of 1932. Uh, <laughs> no, I was and, against uh, Hoover. And, well, it's, he was a third party candidate, uh, looking for a third party candidate. No, Coolidge. Yeah. The, uh, unfortunately, he died in January 1933 and I would not that. have taken office if that. he had been elected. But he's very popular. But the, uh, you get Charles G. Dawes in or somebody. Anyway, the. Uh, <laughs> The, who did not survive the term. You, uh, the, you know, I, it, when I was uh, taking Ec 1 at Harvard in 1964, they said, we're going to teach you about price theory and markets, even though the world doesn't work that way because it's of historic interest. <laughs> and uh, actually, we can maintain low inflation economic growth by manipulating government policies forever. Well, we found out within 10 years that wasn't true. And I think, you know, one area where uh, knowledge has proved to be cumulative uh, has been economics, and there is much more respect for markets among our people and even among most of our elites, certainly the economics departments, than there was a generation ago, uh, which is a development to which Richard has importantly contributed. And so, you know, we don't need to relitigate 1932. We've won back some lost ground. Yeah, I don't want to relitigate 1932. Um, I, I think also, just to add to what Charles says, I think we have to have the right definition of markets. Uh, uh, essentially, you want to get 90% of the truth in this world. It's you restrain force and you encourage cooperation. Markets are one means of cooperation, but charitable organizations, all sorts of philanthropic operations, all sorts of nonprofit associations. Those are markets. Those are markets, too. That's the point. And so that it, you don't need to simply treat it as the cash nexus. That becomes part of it. And it also is a situation where you trust individuals to understand that in some cases monetary relationships are appropriate and some are not. And it gives people the power to sort of organize themselves. I'm constantly reminded, you know, for example, I talk about whether or not we could create markets in organ sales, which I'm very much in favor of. And people say, do you want to sell this like meat on a hoof? I said, no, look, I mean, right now, psychiatric services and supermarket services are supplied by the market, but they're not supplied in an identical way by the individual providers who give them. And what you have to understand is that a market situation has a seller, if you wish to call him that, who must be sensitive to the needs of the buyers. And what we know, and this is one of the important contributions of psychology to this, is if in fact you're an idiot savant who only knows how to calculate dollars and loss, you don't know how to pack somebody on the deck, you'll never be able to close a deal. So that the kinds of characters you have to develop to do markets are extremely important. And the one kind of character that does not survive is aggression and abuse. And so I, I think that you have to basically realize that it's a tremendous tremendously civilizing sort of situations. What you don't want to fall into the trap is to say competitive markets work everywhere. They don't supply network industries. They don't do supply courts. They don't supply public goods. They don't control the waste of wildlife. But there are perfectly coherent ways to deal with these problems once you treat them as difficult exceptions to market situations rather than treating basically voluntary exchange as though it is some kind of another an illegal action. If we start with the right presumption, we'll get the exceptions right. As well. Let me uh, follow up with a question um, which is, represents a, a, a slight turn. Um, a, a lot of the American exceptionalism is built around the question not only of how we see ourselves but, but how the world sees us. And this is often posited as a question of whether Americans are, are or are not living up to the best in themselves and to their the best in their own own values. And the the question I have, I think, and I'd like anybody to any of the four of you to jump in on this, but how do we dovetail the uh, how do we mesh the response to the events of nine eleven with American exceptionalism, and in, in, in what ways has the response to 9-11 compromised American exceptionalism? Has it enhanced American exceptionalism? Has it made, into, has it made any difference? But what, is the, what are the implications of our response to 9-11 and the way we've gone about it 
for the American dream and for American exceptionalism. I think I'd like anybody to jump in. The, Charles, you go ahead. The main defect in our uh, external politics since 9-11, and I would include uh, Iraq in that, has been that we have not succeeded. If we had succeeded, if we had caught Osama bin Laden, uh, if we had somehow done Iraq right, or having concluded it can't be done right, not done it at all, uh, which I, th that's not the alternative I would have chosen, but it's what has to be open-minded about that. I think that this hostility would not exist. But let me we, ask you, let me we, ask you a question. We showed weakness by failing, and so far we have not succeeded. Uh, I think if we can manage to be successful, uh, I think a lot of that hostility will evaporate. Well, let, let me ask you one question. Given that success is a major ingredient, or, or at least in how the world views us and everything, it, it can't be the sole ingredient, can it? Because even if we had succeeded magnificently and there were page after page and day after day of those pictures of Abu Ghraib, wouldn't American exceptionalism still have sustained some damage, notwithstanding a greater element of success? Uh, yes. Yeah, of course. Of course. But, uh, of course, Abu Ghraib was... Uh, a was a total failure. It produced nothing. It produced only negative re results. And it was the result of incompetent, mindless, rather low-level people. But, but, uh, and if we show ourselves to be uh, acting in incompetent ways, and Abu Ghraib, among other things, was totally incompetent, uh, yeah, uh, no, nobody will admire us. There, there's no doubt about that. But uh, I, I, a lot of the, just, just one more thought, a lot of the hostility in the world to us is the other side of the coin of the admiration. Why is it that people want to come here to go to college and graduate school? Uh, why is it that American goods and American culture are, in fact, so popular? Uh, the, uh, the other side of that same coin is envy. And people tend not to feel warmly towards societies and peoples whom they envy. Um, look, um, uh, certainly, I, I think in terms of American success generally, this is the way I would think of it. There's no nation which will ever consistently adhere to the highest ideals in either economic or in political failures. The American success, notwithstanding all the things I've said, has been by the fact that we're least bad amongst many bad alternatives. Uh, we may give up 20 to 25, even 30 percent of an ideal, but if you go to other places, it could be 95 percent, in some places, 60 percent. And if you do those comparisons, that's a big difference. In terms of the American situation on the exceptionalism, though, with respect to 9-11, I think there's both strong pluses and some strong minuses. I think the strong plus is that generally the civil liberties of ordinary citizens have not been seriously impaired by what has happened. And we had a pretty open and vigorous debate, sure. and that's all to the good. Um, on the bad side, I think that uh, the issue that has troubled me most is that of an executive power. And we've had this debate last year, and there was an enormous amount of uneasiness in this room. But I took the position then and take the possession now that the, the presidential power model does not consistent with separation of powers and checks and balances, and that a lot of these kinds of assertions seem to lead people overseas to believe us is trying to have an imperial presidency. It creates that problem at home. I put a lot of blame on the Congress because they didn't seem to take to the ball and try to do the lead. Uh, they didn't get intelligence with respect to surveillance until very late in the game, and they were prepared to authorize the Military Commissions Act, which violates, as far as I can tell, every known and conceivable principle associated with the rule of law in terms of the way in which some of these cases may or may not be tried. But there's going to be a lot of debate over that, and I'm going to get Charles to wince, which is, I suppose, a good thing. But. Um, <laughs> 
But that, I mean, those are the kinds of issues on which, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of disagreement, and the enemies abroad will seize upon them and will magnify them. And so the question we have to face in all of these circumstances, is that the way you want to do it? And I'm a strong believer with respect to trials and criminality and all the rest of it, is when you really care the most, that's when you have to give the greatest level of procedural protections. I have no brief for people who've done wrong things, and I'm sure standard processes could allow you to convict them. But I think if we get nervous about our means, we will see seen weak with respect to our ends. Gordon, you had some comments? Well, I think uh, we aren't the only nation that was attacked, and we forget that. Uh, and our response has been um, different in some respects. So I think we need to have a, a greater sense that we're, the we in the West are all involved in this. And that would help, I think, uh, less. And maybe, maybe we're not an exceptional nation any longer. We're certainly the most greatest military power the world's ever known. But the notion of exceptionalism is to have a special mission to bring democracy to the world. Well, that was presumably what we were doing in Iraq, but now we've given up on that. We're just hoping for stability. And certainly we're not trying to bring democracy to Pakistan, uh, really, because we're not quite sure that democracy will pay off uh, with all those nuclear weapons flying around in the hands of a majority that we can't be sure we're going to get. So I think we probably have to lessen our notion of uh, having this worldwide being in the vanguard of history, at least for the time being, uh, that we're going to bring democracy to the rest of the world, uh, which essentially is the world between, say, Turkey and, uh, and China, uh, and, and maybe bring ourselves together with the rest of the West, which is equally threatened by this uh, Islamic uh, fanaticism. Well, I would just say that, uh, you know, American exceptionalism is a little bit of a hard sell to non-Americans. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, it's kind of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a sort of tension between what I think is the healthy American exceptionalism of the American people and the need to make a foreign policy that, uh, that works in the world. Uh, but I think American exceptionalism is uh, more unpopular among foreign elites than among foreign uh, peoples, uh, and I think that uh, uh, you know you 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 read the uh, European press and so forth. Uh, you you find that America, you know, is the uh, is the great evil and so forth. Uh, but recent elections in places like France, Germany, India, Denmark uh, have brought conspicuously um, the more pro-American of two or more choices uh, to be heads of government. Uh, and I think also there's some rethinking um, in response to Gordon Wood's point that, of course, we're not the only nation that was attacked. Uh, in Britain, uh, the, the multi-culti group is uh, on the defeat. The Labour government and the Conservative government before it encouraged multiculturalism. Let's keep enclaves of immigrants separate. You know, we're sort of uh, heading towards Sharia law. And uh, Tony Blair, to some extent, and Gordon Brown even more so, have been talking about that that's the wrong idea. We need to emphasize Britishness. Now, Brown has a particular need to do that because he's a Scot. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, and he's, uh, you know, a Scottish prime minister of an English nation, just as Tony Blair was the Christian prime minister of a pagan island. But <laughs> the... <laughs> the uh, so, you know, the, the ideas that are represented by American exceptionalism are not as, uh, as, as weak abroad or is not as, as much of a handicap as elite institutions like our press uh, would have us believe sometimes. I think it's time for a couple questions from the floor. Somebody come on up and uh, ask the panelists some questions. Uh, <laughs> There we go. I, uh, I just came from Louisiana, so for Michael Barone, I, I trust that perhaps uh, Indian uh, tutelage may uh, complement the, uh, the French tradition there positively. Here, here. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and for Michael, uh, an earlier analyst of the, uh, the Glorious Revolution, uh, Edmund Burke, at least appeared to have perhaps a motivation of distinguishing between the American Revolution and the French Revolution, the uh, more atheistic uh, or anti-religious uh, tendencies, uh, or at least anti-particular sectarian tendencies in, uh, in the French Revolution, 
And I, and I actually am I'm surprised in a way that the one subject that has not been addressed is the role of religion in American exceptionalism. And, uh, and I'm wondering if uh, really that, I would say that might uh, just be the question in and of itself. Well, we're, you know, an, ex what, an exceptional country in the sense that, uh, uh, what did, uh, you, I think Pat Moynihan said, we're, we're as, as our, our elite is a rule, is our secular as Swedes and our people are as religious as the people of India. Um, the, uh, you know, you pit me up against Edmund Burke. Samuel Johnson said, I have to, when I see, when I have to face Mr. Burke, I must really prepare. So, <laughs> Samuel Johnson was uh, daunted by Edmund Burke, uh, I would be. But, you know, obviously, the United States is a particularly religious country. Many people, intellectuals, historians, writers, have supposed that as history progresses, people would become more secular. Uh, I was ra my parents are atheists, and I was certainly raised to believe this, but the facts uh, don't seem entirely to bear it out. It's mostly true of Western Europe, where there are these uh, buildings uh, maintained often by the public called churches, which are places <laughs> where they have musical productions. <laughs> but, you know, the United States, uh, you know, we in fact, we've seen uh, religious belief thrives in the United States. In Latin America, there is a competition, really, between Catholicism and evangelical Protestantism. In Africa, competition, market competition between Christianity of uh, a rigorous enough sort for appeal to Northern Virginia Episcopalians who don't like the American Episcopalian Church and Islam. Uh, you know, so religion, uh, in, in some sense, this separates us most vividly from um, the American people from, you know, European elites. Yeah. And there's also this huge advantage. Religion of those classic intermediary organizations between the state on the one hand and the person on the other. And there's no question in the United States that if you actually look at religion, it's not only just looking at the aggregates, you've got to look at the shifts across sex. And there's no doubt that the more market and entrepreneurial religious sects have managed to do extremely well, whereas the old line Lutherans, Methodists, and Episcopalians are losing out, largely because their relatively status vision does not be sufficiently attractive to the people who might want to otherwise join their ranks. So you do have another one of these parable there about how this thing plays out. <laughs> Let's uh, go to the back of the room for the next for the next question. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the reason for my question is is uh, partly to make people aware of, of this if they're not already. I'm always surprised at how many people are not aware of this. Uh, I don't know if you saw on uh, Larry King Live, which Lord knows how I happen to watch it, um, but. Uh, Former Mexican President Vicente Fox uh, revealed, uh, much to uh, Larry King's shock, that he and President Bush have a secret agreement to expand NAFTA uh, to create a North American Union, uh, much like the European, European Union, uh, that would include a uh, unified currency between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, uh, which has been dubbed the Amero. Um, I think if we accept the thesis that America is an exceptional nation with um, a special mission, uh, it follows naturally that a loss of na uh, national sovereignty would be a bad thing. Uh, so I'd like to get your take, uh, the panel, generally on the idea of the North American Union and the Amero, uh, and I suppose my question would be how do we stop it? Anybody? I don't think it's going to happen. Not in your lifetime, certainly not in mine. Yeah, look, I mean, there's such an enormous advantage to free trade zones as opposed to creating ever larger sovereignties. I don't think it will happen either. And rather than trying to get a uniform currency, which will create a tremendous questions about spending too much here and too little there, what you want to do is to have the currencies float to one another. And so in general, if you could get the trade side to work, I think that the unification side need not be attempted at all. And this also helps with a little bit of free immigration, or at least more than we have now, because it will reduce some of the pressures that we now see um, in moving in that direction. Yeah, well, Europe is a very interesting manifestation of this. It started out as a customs union. Yes. It ended up as something with a national anthem, uh, <laughs> which I think the first gone, incarnation. Which, that's gone by the board. But um, what you see in that is starting with a perfectly sound notion 
of expanding markets, expanding free trade, uh, the European conception has, and, and Boyden's uh, remarks illustrate this, the European conception has been the inveterate return to the European instinct, which is, well, let's not have free market, that's scary, let us have uniform and very, very deep regulation, uh, and regulation of everything, including including social policy and including the national anthem and so on. So uh, the Europeans really went seriously wrong because they are scared of free markets. And what started out on the right foot has gone seriously awry in this respect. Yeah, I would, I'm, I'm for maintenance of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. <laughs> and, uh, I knew well, I agree. In 1848, but the, uh, in which the, the minister disobeyed the president's instructions and so forth, but he did obey the president Polk's instruction that he must get the harbor of San Diego. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 I mean, that's, that's what, what you're quoting there is really fanciful. In fact, the, the Mexicans maintain their peso really in tandem with the dollar, but, uh, you know, the U.S. economy is ten times the size of the economy of Mexico, which is about the size of the economy of Canada, and I don't think we're going to see a union of those three units beyond the economic union that we have now. All right, back to the front of the room, sir. Yeah? difference between kind of what we, uh, what we, sorry, should I, uh, Professor Epstein, you were speaking earlier about the difference between uh, what, what our lofty goal, goals are and what we actually do. Uh, the Heritage Foundation has endeavored to quantify uh, some areas of freedom, like freedom from taxation and freedom from regulation. Mm -hmm. And on their scale, I believe the United States is like, like freedom from taxation, fiscal freedom is like 116th out of 158 nations measured. And similarly- Is that from the top or the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> That's from the top. Um, so I, I, I wonder though, it, it seems like there's very little discussion of this these are very important areas of liberty. Uh, there seems to be very little national discussion. And I think the guy in the street, you know, might just say that, yeah, America is the freest place on earth. And I wonder if you have an idea whether it's nationalization or, or nationalism or uh, complacency, what, what, what explains that and is, is it something uniquely American? Well, I do think uh, we have a relatively high standard of living in part because whatever our defects in basic economic structure, we're not riven by genuine forms of corruption which, or, or violence, which I think are really much more corrosive on this scheme. But with respect to taxation, the popular sentiments are surely rising. Warren Buffett yesterday gives this, you know, homogeneity, you know, there's this pay into the estate tax and why it is that it breaks up the plutocracies with, as best I can tell, no visible knowledge of how taxation seems to work. And um, it means you can prove you can know how to make money and not have any understanding of the institutions that allow it to survive. So you get an A on one front and a cold flunk F on the other. Um, but the, I do think that on the tax issues, we have a great deal of economic sophistication in various places in the economy and total ignorance in Washington. And this is just another part of the disconnect between the freedom that we talk about in the abstract and our inability to have coherent policies on the ground. And I think anyone who's ever looked at the tax code understands this perfectly well. The tiny exceptions creep in. Uh, the basic American instinct is he got his, therefore, instead of my trying to get rid of it, which is very hard, I'll add my own in, and we come up with a Christmas tree. Yes, ma'am. Uh, also for Professor Epstein, uh, look, I agree with everything you said. Cap capitalism equals freedom, and we have to be diligent on free trade. But I do think you owe it to the group to put a little, this a little more in perspective with what other countries do. You know, it's my understanding, right. even right now as we, as we speak in this room, the United States is holding, hoisting up on its shoulders the considerable economies of India and China, not to mention the entire developing world, by opening our markets to an extent that's almost never been seen before in history. This is what I'm told. It's one of the most magnificent things that we have ever done. Uh, would that it were true? I mean, I think in effect when you go overseas, a lot of the tariffs on you know, raw cloth coming into the United States and things like that are very high. We're constantly hauled before the WTO. 
Um, to the extent that we do it, amen. To the extent that we don't do it, it's a bad sort of thing. As I said before, I mean, it's very difficult on a panel like this to go industry by industry and give specific defenses or indictments. What we can say, in effect, is that we're better at talking about free trade than we're doing it. Let me give you but one illustration. When we insist that we only open free trade to people who adopt American environmental and labor standards, what we're trying to do is to cripple entry by raising their cost of production in order to satisfy domestic interests. So we get half free trade treaties. We're not getting full free trade treaties. And you can't get strong Republican opposition against a very powerful union and democratic pushback on the other side. So we're not angels on the trade war, not even close to it. And in fact, when you go to the EU as an American representative, as I tried several years ago, and you're met with the proposition, well, didn't the President of the United States say that we have to impose tariffs on steel in order to make sure that votes in um, Pennsylvania and West Virginia would remain in the Republican Ohio. column? Oh, is it Ohio? This is hardly transcendental capitalism at its best. <laughs> But nowhere else is better. Right. I, th I said that before. I said the 20 percent that we may be 30 percent. Estonia. Estonia at this point, because they, they have a flat tax. Yeah, because the, <laughs> the bad Estonia only has a million people. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. we'll have more. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is not Jean-Francois Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> I am Francois Ribria. I'm a member of the French Supreme Court Bar and the uh, chair of the Paris chapter. I have you a few things to say very quickly. I think more interesting than remarks about uh, French slavery in Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very much more important. The first thing I would like to say this morning is that I fully disagree with the idea that non-Americans cannot understand American exceptionalism, especially the French. And you know why? Because exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, was invented by a French man, my compatriot, Alexis de Tocqueville. De Tocqueville. And he was the first one. He was the first one in 1831 to understand the advanced nature of American democracy. And you know that our country was the very first one to recognize the independence of your nation in 1778. And uh, Tocqueville uh, remains very essential in that uh, theory of exceptionalism. The second thing I would like to say is that to us, American exceptionalism means uh, a special mission for the happiness of the world. And as Europeans, we know that uh, we owe freedom to your country. Uh, uh, communism and uh, Nazism were not born in the, in the US. They were born in Europe. And you brought freedom to us and we are very grateful for uh, what you, the tremendous tribute of your country to the freedom of Europe, and we do remember that tribute. And to us, it is. <laughs> and to us, it is a part of the exceptionalism we are talking about today. And third, I would like to thank Professor Fried uh, for his uh, talk and remind you that uh, we have in our country a very strong conservative uh, tradition uh, from far, uh, from uh, uh, Frédéric Bastia, Montesquieu, uh, and to Jean-François Revel and Raymond Aron. And I would like to say that we do share the American creed you mentioned today. Thank you. Yes, we have, we have been talking about Adam Smith, uh, but it's a pity we did not mention Tocqueville or Benjamin Constant or that great Frenchman Bastiat who uh, defined government as that institution by which everyone seeks to live at the expense of everyone else. <laughs> Wait a minute, I want the next one. France has had a kind of a tough go of it this morning, and we, we especially appreciate your remarks. Um, yes, sir, back at the end of the room. John? 
Uh, yes, uh, I just following up on the 9-11 uh, discussion, and put it a little more abstractly, isn't one other source now of <laughs> the United States' exceptionalism, and perhaps its mission, the fact that the United States as being the global superpower, the sometimes called the global hegemon, uh, is able to provide public goods of global security around the world and, and what no other individual nation can do because of free rider problems. And that creates another source, perhaps in tension or in reinforcing some of the other sources of American exceptionalism. So I'm wondering what the panelists in general think of this new, or, or at least this uh, in the latter half of this uh, last century, uh, position of the United States as contributing to a new form of American exceptionalism. Well, we, we're in a position, Professor Wood talked about, you know, our unparalleled military power. My sense is that the United States uh, has something like, somewhere between 60 and 75 percent of the world's out of area military capacity. Uh, you know, people, critics of uh, President Bush have said, well, the Iraq War, uh, you know, it, there are maybe 32 allies, but most of them aren't contributing, you know, 90 percent of the troops are Americans. That's going to be true of any major out of area uh, military conflict in which the U.S. is involved for the foreseeable future. Uh, and. Uh, is it liable to raise resentments and, uh, and, and cause us uh, problems in that direction? I, I think so. But I think, on the other hand, uh, not having that military capacity, as we learned in you know, 1941, is not such a good idea either. I mean, I think we're responsible for the stability of, of everywhere in the world except for the, for the Middle East. Yeah, and, and, and that's the last, um, the, the last place that we, we can't seem to Make, make a difference. And, and one of the, the true great achievements on, on the pro-American side is that for the most part when you have that kind of real monopoly power, you try to impose good faith and fiduciary duties on its exercise. And I think we've been pretty good for the most part about not using it for short-term provincial advantage. We may be misguided in a place like Iraq, but we're not perverse. And in fact, the error in Iraq may be that we temporize instead of going in with more force rather than less. And so, I mean, you know, you may be critical of the president on executive power issues and critical of the nation because we get ourselves into these compromised positions, which is just like Vietnam, where we go in with just enough to lose. Well, I think, we, I think we're, we're ignoring, the, I think, the, the considerable progress that we appear Made to have been made on the surge strategy. Which is exactly the right way to move. Which seems to me to be uh, that, that we may see an outcome uh, considerably more positive than uh, most opinion in the United States has been expecting. But that's, because we, that's because we abandoned the temporizing model. Yes. I'm going to have to make this. I'm sorry, but it's going to have to be the last question because we're running very short of, of Thank of you time. very much. Um, I would like to know, since uh, on the panel we have, uh, we've been discussing elites, and we have uh, uh, media elites and academic elites on the panel, why is it that the academy and the media and foundation boards, for instance, why do they not share the sentiments of the rest of the people? Is it by being different they, they get a sense of superiority? That's, look, that's really hard, but, but part of the situation is, is that we try to insulate our elites from academic pressure and we give enormous prizes to the talk. And, and what happens is the moment you become socialist, you have to remember our Oscar Wilde's dictum, which is that socialism ruins your evening. Uh, if we really believe in the talking as opposed to the exchanging mode of doing business, we now give academics more influence because that's our comparative advantage. Um, and, and I do think that there's to some extent the insulation from real financial pressures um, has an enormous ability for people to kind of imagine uh, that the wealth which is given to them is created out of thin air and they tend to lose appreciation of what it does and requires to create wealth in a dynamic economy. We really are insulated for good, for independence, and bad because to create ignorance. I think it's also elites. Our elites tend to be more secular, uh, to seek personal liberties in, uh, in, of various sorts, and to be, and, and that lines them up in the America that we have today. Politically, uh, they play team ball uh, with the idea that this is not a special country. I also think the experience uh, of my own uh, era and of myself included of avoidance of military service in time of war on the part of the elite has contributed importantly to this. If you didn't serve, you could either think yourself a bad guy or you could think your country a bad country. 
And I think a lot of elites starting in the 1960s, continuing to the present day, have chosen to think their country a bad country. On that happy note. I want to, um, you know, it, it, one of the real pleasures is being in an audience like this with a panel like this. I've often thought that the great danger to American exceptionalism was that we stopped believing in ourselves. And what's, what's really heartwarming to me is to be in a room of, of people who, while not oblivious to this country's faults, do strongly believe in American exceptionalism and what this country has to give and contribute to the rest of the world. And to be among such a great group of panelists, and you can see their, not just their enormous erudition, but their great devotion and belief in the ideals and the values of this country. And I hope all of us can give these four panelists a fantastic hand because they've been wonderful. One housekeeping matter, Justice Thomas will be here at 1130 and there will be a 15 minute intermission and I think that there will be cards passed around if you have a question for Justice Thomas, uh, try to get one of those cards and, and submit it.